A really important one is the 23,000 kids age out of the system. What that means is they turn 18 never having been placed with an adoptive family. So you turn 18, you are moved out of your foster home to what? To what? You don't have a safety net of a family. Very small percentage go to college, even though there are immense opportunities for them to go to college. Um, there was a new law that just passed that allows them to keep their insurance until 24, I believe. Don't quote me on that, but that they can at least keep their insurance from the state until then. And there are some programs in place to help kids when they turn 18, but it's not enough. Not enough. So those are really important um, to give you a view of the statistics. The nudge. I think this was talked about here if you're at Heart of the Lakes in December, they talked about the nudge. For me, the nudge is the Holy Spirit putting something on my heart and not letting go of it. It's the way that God talks to me. For me, that happened when I was 16 years old. When I was 16, I grew up in low-income housing and police and what we call DCYF was there all the time in our housing complex. My neighbors had five kids and at some point, all five of those kids were removed from the home due to um, neglect, abuse, drugs, mental health issues. So when I was 16, I remember going to my mother and I said, I think I'm supposed to adopt and do foster care when I'm older. I think I wanna make a difference because I see this going on in my neighborhood. And my mother's response was, no, nah, you'll feel different. You'll feel different when you get older. I said, I have like no desire to be pregnant. Like breastfeeding kind of grosses me out. <laughs> like I just had none of that kind of biological maternal stuff going on at all. And she's like, you'll feel different when you, when you get married. You'll feel different when you get pregnant. Well, I meet a man and I tell him, I think I'm supposed to, not nah, as age 16, in my 20s now, I meet a man and I tell him, I think I'm supposed to adopt in my life. And he says, I can't deal with that. I want biological children. I don't want all the baggage that goes with adoption. And we broke up. About two years later, I met another man and I said, right off the bat this time, I was like, just so you know, I think God's put foster care and adoption on my heart. I think it's something I'm supposed to do. And he went, Okay, and I was like, okay. Foster care adoption was normal in his family. Half of his cousins were adopted mm -hmm. and his aunts did foster care. Well, five months later, I accepted his proposal and we were married seven months later than that. And my husband, Greg and I, since we've been married 16 years, we've done 10 years of adoption and foster care with 11 different children. Um, that nudge is placed in my heart, 16, didn't actually happen until I was in my 30s, and God had prepared my husband in the exact same way, that his heart was open to it too. So I was 31, and um, we're finally ready to do foster care and adoption. We're at a stable place, where we've been married for a couple years, we were ready to do it. And so we went and took classes, and you become a certified foster parent through the state, um, that's the route that we went through, was through DCYF, or Health and Human Services here in Michigan. Um, at the time, we lived in Massachusetts. And they go around and they ask you, well, what kind of child do you want? Do you want a baby? Do you want an older kid? Do you want a boy? Do you want a girl? Do you want one? Do you want four? And what kind of behaviors can you handle? Can you handle lying? Can you handle theft? Can you handle those who have been sexually abused? Can you handle fire starters? That's like a category. Um, can you handle kids with mental health issues or physical health issues? And we were young and naive and we said, we'll handle whatever God throws at us, whatever God places in our family we'll take. And the social worker was like, yes, I think she thought she hit gold. <laughs> like someone who said they'll do anything. <laughs> so we get donated a bunk bed to us and Greg spent an entire night putting up this bunk bed nightmare literally till 4 a.m. in the morning. This bunk bed was horrible. 4 a.m., he finally goes to sleep. The next morning, 9 a.m., he gets a phone call. He answers, we get a phone call, he answers the phone. And all I can hear him say is, yes, yes, that sounds good. Okay, a boy, okay, okay. I'll hang up the phone and I'm sitting there going, what did you just agree to? <laughs> and he tells me that he agreed to a newborn baby boy 
due sometime in the month of October. And that's literally all we knew. No prenatal care, so they didn't even know when a due date was. All we knew was October, and all we knew there was gonna be a boy that was gonna be removed immediately upon birth because he was number four. All the older three children were already <coughs> removed from the home and placed in permanent families. They, none of those permanent families could take a baby. They always try to keep siblings together. So we agreed to this newborn knowing nothing. Every day we're checking our phones, we have our phones on us, we're like ready to go the minute this baby's born. And finally, October 21st, we get a phone call and they said, the baby's born, be here in two hours. Okay, <laughs> literally ran out of the office, yelled at the boss, the baby's here, gotta go. <laughs> like, I don't even think I turned off lights or anything or locked up, I think I just ran out. We raced to the hospital and we're ushered into this room all by ourselves. And we're waiting and we're waiting. And we're like, what is going on? Well, they finally come and they tell us that the biological parents had made threats to kidnap the baby. So police were now involved and we were not allowed into any other space of the hospital until it was declared safe and the biological parents had been escorted off property. So finally we get the all clear. We go in into the sterile nursery. The only baby sitting in one of those plastic bassinet things and he was all wrapped up like a little burrito in a white itchy hospital blanket and he's got these puffy little cheeks and blue eyes all by himself. And we walk up and we just stare at this bassinet. We just staring at him. And I don't know how long it was, but finally the nurse said, you can touch him. <laughs> okay. Picked him up. This picture is me feeding Ryan for the first time. Um, you can see it in his little hospital blanket. We hadn't even changed him yet or anything. We had brought clothes to change him into and stuff. That then began, well, let me back up. We're signing paperwork to release him and bring him home. And they tell us two things. First of all, you will have a police escort off of hospital grounds because of these threats that the biological parents have made. And second, the nurse said, you need to do the paperwork over again. I said, what do you mean over again? She goes, well, you put the baby's birth date. I said, no, I didn't, I put mine. Ryan was born the day before, October 20th, on my birthday. We have the same birthday. Now, if that's not a sign from God that this is our child, right? And I clung to that promise because it took 1,148 days of being in foster care before we could adopt Ryan. He was more than three years old by the time that adoption date finally came. The legal process is, as an adoptive parent, a nightmare. Um, it is long and it is based around the biological parents' legal rights. They get the right to go through a whole court case. They get the right to go through two appeal processes. Each biological mother and biological father, not even as a team, each. And every day of those 1,148 days, I lived in fear. My anxiety and my nerves were just shot because any day they could come take him away from me. Any day that phone could ring and I could hear the judge change his mind, he's gonna be reunited and he could be taken away from me. It didn't matter any of the previous evidence or the older children's cases, which is what they based Ryan's case on. His biological parents had severe mental health issues, severe. Um, and advocates got involved and tried to fight and it became political. It was so messy and heartbreaking, the whole thing. We got to know the biological parents because during this time he still had visits with them. I had to take him to go visit them. Um, his older three siblings we got to know because they were often in these visits as well. But when an adoption day finally came, family flew in, our friends came, and we celebrated before the judge and it was amazing. <laughs> so the first picture is my husband and I and Ryan. Keep in mind he's more than three years old now. And the second picture is with the judge and it's kind of hard to tell because one of the really cool things was the older two siblings, the next two oldest, were in the same court case as us 
and got to all be adopted together. So in the same adoption ceremony, his two brother and sister and Ryan were all together in the adoption ceremony. And his older sister, the oldest, was able to come watch and celebrate with us. And as a result of some of that, we got to know the other adoptive families really well. And we still keep in contact to this day. Ryan does not have relationships with his biological siblings. Um, because he was so little and he never lived with them or anything, he knows of them and he, we exchange school pictures and Christmas cards and stuff, but there's not really a relationship there just because he was so little. Um, but that depends on the child. So. so then we moved to New Hampshire. And when we moved to New Hampshire, we ended up in this really big house that had extra bedrooms. And we started to pray. What do we do with this big house with these extra bedrooms? And God put on our heart, if everyone who had an extra bedroom took in a child, there would be no need for the foster care system. Mm -hmm. That's when he spoke to me very loud and clear. And I went to my husband again, and I said, uh, I think we're supposed to do foster care. And he said, okay. <laughs> so we did. We opened our home. We had 11 kids between Ryan and our girls. Um, and again, we said, we'll take whomever. And for some reason, most of those children were teenage girls. We never said teenage girls. It just happened to be placed. I was a youth pastor at the time, so I loved teenagers. I thought it was great. Um, I want to share a little bit of some of their stories to give you a big picture. The one in the far picture is our family photo because whomever lived with us when we did family photos was a member of our family. It didn't matter whether they had been there for a week or if they had been there for a year with us. And that young lady's name is Cheyenne. Cheyenne came to us when she was 16. Um, she had been homeless for a while. She had been abused. She had been neglected. There were mental health issues with the biological parents. She came to us and um, we just adored her. She was wonderful. She aged out at age 18. We offered to let her stay. We, basically, we begged her to stay with us. But she didn't want to. And she was 18, she didn't have to. So she went off on her own. Eight months later, she got pregnant. About two weeks after that, her child got removed by DCYF and entered the foster care system. The cycle of foster care is so deep. So many kids who are in the foster care, their parents were, and their children will be. It is a cycle that really can only be broken by adoption and by mentorship and by families intervening and loving on these kids in the system. It's a thick, thick cycle and Cheyenne's an example of that. This young lady's name is Rachel. Rachel came to us when she was 14 um, and lived with us till she was 18. She was actually a member of our church and I was actually at her mentor at church. So when it became clear that she needed a place to live, it was a natural thing. She had already been spending time at my house and with my family, so she moved in with us. Now, this is Ryan in both of these pictures. Here's the interesting thing. These girls came into our house hurt, broken. Rachel didn't like to be touched. Like, you couldn't even hug her. She didn't like to be touched at all. Um, Cheyenne had a distrust of men. Um, she never let the walls down with my husband completely because she had a distrust with men. But Ryan, Ryan's intellectually disabled, but I'll tell you, that kid has the biggest heart and the biggest spirit of God living in him. It's phenomenal. If you know him, he, they call him the mayor at school because he knows everybody and everyone knows Ryan. And um, he's just a lover through and through. He could crawl in these girls' laps. Rachel would hug him like a teddy bear and cuddle with him on the couch. No one else could touch her except for Ryan. When Cheyenne moved out, we we're all crying in tears, but it was when she hugged Ryan that those tears started to come. Sometimes people think, what will foster care or adoption do to my biological children or children I already have in the home? My question is, what are you teaching them? For us, we taught Ryan to have an open home, to have an open heart, and to love on people unconditionally. And in return, he did. And he changed these girls' lives. 
it was really amazing what children already in the home can do when new children come in. And it's nothing to be afraid of, I just want to say that very clearly. Um, we still keep in contact with Cheyenne, whose daughter was adopted to a family waiting through foster care. Um, Rachel, though, has a disease called reactive attachment disorder. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about trauma, but um, reactive attachment disorder is called RAD for short. And what it is is that they cannot attach and build relationships in healthy ways. So the minute that Rachel would realize she was getting close to one of us, she would do something to destroy that relationship. Subconsciously, sometimes purposely. Anything from she ran away, she brought drugs in my home, um, she got together with very uh, inappropriate men, um, anything like that to break the relationship. Some of the worst things I've ever been called have come from Rachel because she couldn't handle a relationship because she never had a healthy one her entire life. So how is she supposed to know what that looks like? Um, trauma and those kinds of things in foster care kids is real. We had gone through this cycle of teenage girls and children in our home. My heart just longed for a little girl. I wanted a little girl so desperately. Um, where to the point where my friends were starting to have babies and stuff and my heart would just like twist because I wanted it so bad. So Greg and I called our social worker and we said, okay, we're ready to do adoption again. And we think we're stable enough and Ryan's in a good spot. So if you see little girls, let us know. Um, and she's like, okay, I will. About six months later, I'm at work and I get an email and it's one of those lists that are just like sent to you automatically. I'll say this, I never received that list before and I have never received it since. One email, all I've gotten in all my years, this list. And on this list were two sisters, six and nine years old. And I'm reading it and I'm like, oh my goodness. And so I call Greg right away at work. I'm at work and I told him, and he said, call the social worker right away. I call the social worker and she said, I literally had a meeting this morning for these girls and your family was brought up in that meeting. <laughs> two weeks later, the girls came to visit. Alana, the younger one, um, came in and hid behind the social worker. She would not leave that social worker. She was hidden behind her the whole time. She walked in. Leanne, my older one, who's now in middle school, some of you know her, she walked in with a backpack on one <laughs> shoulder and a basketball on the other, soccer ball. It was a soccer ball on the other. And she walked in like the tough little cookie that she is. We spent time together that whole day at the house. And I got to know Ryan. By the time the day was over, Alana was coloring on my husband's lap, and Leanne was sitting on the couch with her feet on my table. <laughs> it was meant to be. <laughs> uh, one month later, they moved in, and one year later, they were adopted. Now, the difference between them being adopted in a year and Ryan taking more than three years is that they were already terminated, it's called, meaning the parental rights had already gone through the court process and were terminated. So they were free and clear. Ryan, we were in that midst of the court case. So that's why it took different levels. The girls are the classic case of biological parents in this opiate crisis. Their mother is a heroin addict. And stereotypical things, steal whatever she could steal to one, provide for her family, but two, to get money for her drugs. Um, she would go home with whichever guy would buy the hotel room for the night with her children. So there were different hotel rooms every night with whoever would buy the hotel room. Um, she would drop the kids off at the grandmother's and go on binges. She was arrested over and over and over again. I, I mean, it, it, it's just like one of those, unfortunately, very common cases in the system. So when the girls were adopted, we had built a relationship with the grandmother and still maintain that relationship with the grandmother and had the grandmother's blessing for adoption because she wanted more for her kids. And she knew as a grandmother, she couldn't do it. She had to give them space from the biological family. She knew that. And she knew that she wanted them to be active in the community and church and school and the grandmother's not at a place that she could do that. So she blessed her adoption. It was amazing. Um, if I can get this video working, let me set it up for you. So the girls have been with us for a year. 
we finally get a court date. We've been waiting for this court date to go before the judge and we wanted to surprise the girls. So that sign that was in the beginning, we wrapped that up and one girl has the sign to unwrap and the other girl has the note saying what's going on. Okay, so I hope the video works and I hope you can hear it. It did not work in the earlier session. <laughs> so we shall see. Okay, so this is us surprising the girls. From the day that we surprised them and then that's the day of court where they're all dressed up all three of them <laughs> and the three musketeers i'll tell you since the day they walked in our house um they've been like the three musketeers and they still are very close three of them um now they're typical siblings okay they squabble they fight they get on each other's nerves ryan's figured out that he's getting bigger than a lot i can like wail on her i mean typical siblings okay there it doesn't matter if they're blood or not I wish I could say that that's the end of the story and it's all rainbows and unicorns. But the reality is that these children who come from such traumatic situations carry PTSD with them regardless of the loving environment that they're in. And even my adopted children, it's, it's deep and it's harmful and hurtful and painful and exhausting to be really honest with you. Um, some of my children have really deep walls that when something happens to them, they put it in a box and they don't wanna let down their wall to be vulnerable enough because they've been hurt so many times. I have another child who's so sensitive that she just cries all the time when something hurts her little heart and she can't understand it. My girls have been in therapy almost their entire lives since they've been in foster care. And it's just something we continuously work through. The things like you may look at a typical child and see lying or stealing or misbehavior um, or temper tantrums or emotion tantrums. And you just think, okay, they're just kids being kids. Not for my kids. There's always something deeper when you've been through trauma the way that my girls have been through trauma. A temper tantrum is never just a temper tantrum. Stealing is never just about the piece of candy that they steal. There's always something deeper. And that's what trauma does to children. And the longer they're in the foster care system, the deeper that trauma becomes. And being into a stable, loving Christian family, Jesus makes the difference, I'll tell you. But they're not healed because it's so deep. Even Alana was six years old when she came to us and you think, oh, when they're little, it'll be okay. 
But those formative years when their little brain synapses are literally growing because um, of stimulation, what happens if they don't have stimulation? Their definitions of love are so distorted. I'll just give you a quick example. Um, Alana, when she first came to us, said, you never hug me, you never touch me, you never give me affection. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, we hug and touch all the time. Well, Mama Lisa, that's what she calls her biological mother, Mama Lisa, I'd curl up on the couch with her for hours every day. Mama Lisa was blacked out on the couch or hung over or coming off of a high, passed out on the couch and little two-year-old Alana would be laying with her on the couch. So that then became her definition of affection. What do you do when you're now in the real world of a healthy world and you can't lay on the couch for hours holding a child? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That definition of affection and attention and love is so distorted when they come from these backgrounds. But here's the good news, Jesus heals. The good news is that God works and that families make a difference. If there was no hope, I would not continue to do this. But there is hope. And I believe that for these children. And I believe that we are called as Christians to step in and be the love of Jesus and change that distorted perception of love and stop this cycle that is perpetuating our foster care system. So my question to you is, why are you sitting here today? What is on your heart? What is God nudging you? Is it to open up your home for foster or adoption? Is it to volunteer? Is it to support a foster care family? Every single one of those things are equally important. And every one of those things can be done by anyone at any stage of life. I want to be very clear with that. Here are some really specific examples. Um, ways you can support meals and groceries. The one family I had in foster care that was not my teenage girls was three little girls under the age of three, and Ryan was five. That meant I had four children under the age of five at once. To go to the grocery store was a nightmare. I would go at midnight to like the 24 hour stores because they were in bed. If someone else would have taken that burden off of me, it would have been amazing if someone else would have picked up my groceries for me. Um, errands and CVS. This one my best friend did for me when we lived in New Hampshire. She would call me and say, hey, I'm running errands. What can I get for you? Great, I need Kleenex or toilet paper or whatever. She'd pick it up. I put CVS, but pharmacy is what I mean by that, any pharmacy. All these children are a medication for the PTSD and mental health issues. So my best friend would go pick up, she was a, a foster parent as well. So she'd go pick up her kid's medication and I gave her a release to pick up my kid's medication. One less errand for me to run. It was huge. Entry clothing and hygiene kits. When children come to you, I have had the phone call at midnight. We need an emergency placement. Can we bring you a child? Um, often they don't have like shampoo, toilet paper, uh, toothpaste, toothbrushes. Um, if they have clothes, it's usually very minimal. I have been at Walmart at midnight buying underwear for the next day because I had children that had no clean clothes for the next day. Um, anything like that is wonderful. Hygiene kits or hand-me-downs. Get your background checked. Do respite. Drive these kids, right? Respite is like babysitting. You, I can't even as a foster parent, I couldn't just have the next door neighbor babysit. You gotta be background checked and put through the system for safety purposes. Um, and think about it. If the kids are in sports and if they go to youth group and stuff and they're in therapy every week, and they have visits with biological families every week. Or Ryan, for instance, had physical therapy every week too. And you now have three kids. I lived in my car. It was insane. If someone would have been willing to drive them, it would have been such a blessing. Um, Hand-me-downs, toys, gear. As I said, we only had a month to put together a whole nursery for Ryan. And the hand-me-downs and the gear that we got was phenomenal. Um, otherwise, how are you supposed to be able to do that? No, and you don't know that kids can be with you for a month or for a year. I'm not gonna go supply a whole nursery, you know? So hand-me-downs are wonderful. Um, pay for a class or camp. Okay, foster care through the state pays you, 
okay? That to be really real. But it really only covers the basic necessities, grocery, clothing, that kind of thing. I did not profit, if you will, at any point off foster care money. Um, so when our family started to say, I'll pay for swim class, or I'll pay for this activity, it was a huge blessing, huge blessing to us that the kids could do what they've always dreamed of doing. <coughs> um, not judging is just a huge thing. Trauma kids are different. I'm so grateful that I have a really good support system in my family and in circle of friends. A lot of them, my friends are foster adopt parents themselves that don't judge because the mommy shame is real. And when people don't understand that your kid's a trauma kid and they're shaming you, it's horrible. I'll give you a real short story. Um, I was buying formula for Ryan and some lady literally stopped me in the grocery store and lectured me about how breastfeeding is best and how dare I be buying formula for the child. In the grocery store, a perfect stranger. I looked at her and I said, this is a foster baby. And I turned around and walked away. Yeah. It's real, the shame is real. So just don't judge. Um, become a CASA. CASA is a court advocate who, how is the judge supposed to make this decision and he doesn't know the children, right? They don't ever meet the children except in court once or twice. Um, the CASA is an in-between person. The CASA builds a relationship with the foster and adopt family and the children and then reports back to the judge and gives their opinion about what could be best for that child. So if you want to love on kids and build relationships with kids and advocate for kids, CASAs are wonderful, wonderful options. We still have relationships with both of our CASAs from our two adoption situations. They're just wonderful people. Um, so consider becoming a CASA. Okay. If you think you're supposed to open your home. Here's my best advice. Pray, first of all. Talk to your family or whomever your tribe is because you cannot do it alone. You cannot do it alone. And then go talk to people who have been down this road. Right? I am happy to talk with anybody that wants to talk about it. Cody and Bethany um, from our church, our youth pastor, just went through an adoption situation and they're willing to talk about it. And um, if you're local in the area, I don't know if you know us, but we actually have a lot of clergy, a lot of pastors in our area who are adopted. Rick down at um, Cross Point was adopted and he's willing to talk about it. Come talk to us, we're willing to share our stories. And then how you take the next step is you contact Human Services, um, Health and Human Services here in Michigan, and they'll connect you with the appropriate agency. We went right through the state um, out in New England but there's agencies here in Michigan as well. Um, Cody went through Bethany Christian Services, for instance. Lutheran Services is another big one here in Michigan. They're the same pool of children, but the need is so big, the state can't do it by itself. So they contract out with these agencies to help find homes. Um, so there's lots of options. So this banner, we created our very first summer, we went to family camp and with our girls, the first summer with our girls, and we created this banner, Burial Forever Family, it says in John 10, 10. This is our family Bible verse, our family mission. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full, John 10, 10. This is what foster care and adoption is. Giving these kids life and giving them life to the full and doing it in the name of Jesus. And that's our family verse. And that's the purpose of why I said yes today. Because my question to you is, what is the nudge on your heart? What is God using you for to give kids life to the fullest? Let's close in prayer. Lord God, I want to thank you for each one of these ladies. I know that you are using their hearts to help these children in some way, even if it's just praying for them, Lord God. Nudge them in the direction that you want them to go. Sometimes we need neon signs. Beat us over the head, Lord. We want to serve you. And we want these children to live life to the fullest. In your son's name. Amen. Amen. Yes. You didn't mention the mayor site. They can go oh, yeah. to mayor dot it's M A R E dot org. Mm -hmm. And you can see all of the children who are waiting for homes. Yeah. Now uh, my declaration about that is they are the hard to place children. Hard to place means the trauma and the trauma behaviors are rather severe. 
So I you can read it on there. You yes. Can, you can look up the rating, emotional or physical or yeah. whatever. Yeah. But if they're the ones that really need yeah. people to step up. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, ladies. Yeah. Thank I think we're supposed to head back to the sanctuary for closing. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want to talk at any point, contact me, okay? All right. Thank you. Watch your eyes when I turn on my eyes. <laughs> I want some naughty pie and a couple other souvenirs from there. Yeah. I'm telling you. Yeah. And my dad, I let him know, and he's just sick. Yeah. Just yeah. Um, what are you seeing on Facebook too? So I let me let me know. Yeah, yeah. I'll be in touch. Maybe I can come out. Yeah, I would love it. Leslie. All right. You did a super you. job. <laughs> really, a super job. Thank you. Thank you. So if you guys want to talk more as we get to that point, let me know. I would sometime like to meet up with you even to talk yeah. about where we're at right now. I love that. I love okay. that. You know where to find me. And, and I know your son and my son get along great together, so that would be good. Phil, Phil gets along with everybody. Uh, that was excellent, Trish. Thank you. I hate that I have to like speed through, you know, because there's just not enough time. No, there isn't. But, but you did. It was. It was nice. I gave enough of an overview. It was personal. You. You turned. You can do chairs. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you guys. I yep. appreciate it. Well, let me turn off my phone. Do you want me to help you with anything? I just have to pack up my stuff. I'm wondering if I should do that after session or not.